away with winter. Hello, summer. So Don and I are enjoying our Saturday. Yep. He's sitting here taking a survey. Uh, from, uh, from the University of California at Davis, the survey is called New Vehicle Technologies Survey. It was supposed to take 30 minutes, and granted, we've had phone calls, breakfast, uh, and a few other things going on. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it, he's been working on it for... It'll be three hours. <laughs> I was going to say 90 minutes going on two hours, but, you know, give or take a little bit. Well, it's... Let's just say... Don's been thorough, and we've chatted together about certain responses, which is probably a more accurate yeah. response than if he had just taken the two seconds they figured and, and answered it. So I'm proud of you. You've done a you know thorough, right. thorough job. I mean, if you're going to answer a survey, you ought to do it right. right. You don't uh -huh. want to just do it to get through it. So, right. uh, yeah. So what do you think is the most uh, interesting question they asked, or which one did we well, debate, debate the okay. most? Tell us about one or two of the questions. Right. The, um, they got into um, uh, the self-driving and uh, about what is your... They, they were cutting hairs, and they wanted to, and they were very specific. It says, we are cutting hairs between... Self-driving cars, totally autonomous cars, but they have a steering wheel and driver controls, meaning that you could drive this thing if you wanted to. If you wanted to, you could drive it, or you could just say, please drive me. That was one kind of a car. And then the other kind of car is an autonomous car with no driving controls, meaning you got to get in it, tell it where to go, and how and what it does is up to it. And they were very... They were cutting hairs between those two, asking you the question, you know, in this case and that case, like, how much more would you pay for a car with driving controls that was autonomous versus a car that was autonomous without driving controls? Have you ever thought about it? How much more would you pay to have those controls? Would you pay more? Uh, it's a funny question since you've never had a car without controls. Right. Would you be more likely to take a ride-sharing service... Uh, if there was an autonomous car with driving controls, but no driver, versus a uh, autonomous car with dr a driverless car with no controls, uh, stuff like that. I mean, they were, uh, and I'm not talking one question. I'm talking probably 25 questions. The this you know shades of gray between those, and it, one of the things that helped Marianne, well, we discussed all this stuff. One of the things that we came to realize was we as a as a household of uh, Mary and I are very unlikely to ever be willing to buy a autonomous car with no driving controls. I want a steering wheel. We both enjoy driving enough that you know we certainly you know I want to get on the interstate and say take me to Atlanta and I'm going to dive down and read my book or or watch my DVD or whatever. Take a nap. Take a nap. <laughs> totally want that. But you know, when sometimes when Mary and I we take these drives through here or there, I like driving the car. So uh, I definitely want the steering controls. And so I actually put down I'd pay more. Uh, and, and well, we basically realized we don't want a car without driving controls because what happens if you? And again, this is you own the car. Um, uh, and we're in our driveway here. Is there really going to be an autonomous car that's going to go down our driveway? Or are we going to have to have our iPad or our phone out and on our using our phone or iPad at one mile per hour navigate our driveway? And we're going to have to do that every day? Every time we use it? Maybe the first ten times? Don't know. So I'm just saying, uh, you know, I would just as soon get my car out, you know, drive it out my garage back it out you know do all that stuff and then turn it and say okay now take me to north raleigh uh you know i, I guess so i just want to be able to take off and leave all the other cars at the traffic light right. Miriam wants to out accelerate uh, i mean yeah, yeah i mean how am i supposed to just give up that thrill of acceleration to the car you know i just yeah just that would be so boring and the other 100 percent of the time and the other thing is they didn't differentiate between self-driving electric cars and self-driving gas cars and i they asked for feedback on the survey and i said that you know they're not mutually exclusive you should have you know they did all they these shades of gray 
they should have done that shade they should have added that shade of gray I am more likely to pick a car sharing service uh, and they ask car sh a lot of questions on those cutting those fine things between driverless self uh, uh, on demand driverless cars with no steering controls and a driverless car with steering controls uh, on demand you know they sh I'm more likely to pick a uh, car service irrelevant if it's driving or not if it has electric cars versus gasoline cars or a rental car company a rental or car, whatever all yeah. those things so I think that they they miss that uh, how important how much from a buying decision or choosing to whether to use a service or not uh, to me if it's electric that that's a plus I'm more likely to use it and if it's gasoline or diesel I'm less likely to use it and they did ask the question about uh well you know are you opposed to sharing a ride in a ride sharing service autonomous driverless you know do you want to share stuff like that they did ask so overall i mean you could tell this was a definitely an academic survey somebody put a lot of or a committee put a lot of work into it uh there were a couple questions that i felt like they could have uh, clarified they were got into the policy questions um and you know Different people coming from different backgrounds are going to read that question different, and I think they're going to get inconsistent answers based on your your background. Uh, they ask us what kind of cars they have, and, and like one of the things that I I felt felt they missed is because I am taking the survey, but I'm not the primary primary driver of our Tesla. Uh, they asked me about my commute. They never asked me about Marianne's commute in the Tesla and the questions were focused on the way I use my Scion because that's the car that I commute with and so I I think from that part that point of view because they you know they could they didn't pick they should have picked the Tesla but I don't know what I have no idea why they chose to pick the Scion because they asked us which car, which person was the primary driver, and I guess because Marianne was the primary driver of the Honda and the Tesla, and I'm the primary driver of the GMC and the Scion, they just said, "Oh well, I'm just going to ask you about the Scion or the GMC." They never considered, you know, Marianne. So I felt that was a little bad because uh, it would have been because they kept talking household, household, household. So it would have fit. Said, so, you know, for the the car that drives the most miles, because they asked me how many drive miles we drove each car for this big car that the, you know, which is the Tesla. I mean, we're pushing twenty-five thousand miles on that thing now, and that's less than a year. Uh, we're, uh, you know, it just made more sense. So I guess that from that standpoint, I'm trying to give them that feedback because they did ask for that feedback that they probably ought to pick the big commute car to, because that would be the one. You know, uh, replacing the Scion, well, maybe that would be true. I could replace the Scion with a self-driving car, uh, an autonomous ride-sharing car, quicker than I could replace the Tesla. So maybe they, they know more about this than I gave them credit for. I don't know. I just think they missed it there. So one of the other questions that Don asked me, because they asked him, right. was uh, how likely were we to use an autonomous ride-sharing service? Well, considering that we have uh, four cars for currently two drivers, yeah, we're not. Not, not likely. And also, um, considering that they would want us to pay more for that service than we're willing to pay. Like, it would have to be so cheap, you know, uh, that it would just be, you know, easy for us to make that decision. And then on top of enjoying the drive. And the convenience of right this second I decide I'm going someplace and I don't have to wait for a car to show up. I mean, even honestly for me, waiting an extra five or ten minutes, I got to get to Taekwondo and I'm going to like call some service and wait for it to show up. I'm just not, it's probably not going to not gonna happen. So we basically determined the, the chances of us using a autonomous ride sharing service are really slim. The only times we could come up with were maybe three to five times a year and you know those services don pointed out they're they're not going to make money off of people that only want to use them three yeah, or five i mean if i'm too sick to go get the boys from school and don's not available um maybe i'm in the middle of cooking something in the kitchen and i need something yeah. from the store and i just send johnny and somebody else's you know in the car to go get it um 
I really couldn't come up with a lot of reasons why we would use it. Right, we are not the the the, the case for a uh, business case for autonomous self-driving ride sharing services. Because we have four cars not because we're filthy rich. It's we just We just hold on to them cuz they're yeah. Well, they're good they're still good reliable cars for us and we can give them away. I right. mean, we could do that, but there's no selling them the the cost is all sunk we've got it's, you know they cost us what they cost us you know the next time the scion it blows out of, if it blows out a transmission or something like that you know we'll just donate it or give it away or or scrap it i mean the two or three thousand dollars that we might get out of it after and plus all the hassle of selling a car you know it's just it's just not worth it if i could somebody would walk up and say oh well we'll give you five thousand dollars cash money for the the odyssey i'd probably sir here it is but we're not gonna do it we're gonna have to add we're gonna have to go through and people are gonna want to drive it and, you know it, it's a different thing when you have old cars and you're selling old cars you know it's one thing if it's a three-year-old bmw well, 5 series merged household too right it's just it's not practical anyway i'm just saying is that we're we're not the kind of people that is, uh, we've already got cars, uh, they're already cost us what they cost us. The more that we use those cars, the, the cheaper they get for us until there's a major repair. And I think um, it's worth noting that um, Don and I both agree that as we get older, yeah, one of the things we are counting on this autonomous technology getting being available is so that we can um, maintain our independence and go run errands if we're not really able to drive the car as good as when we were 50 or 25. Right. We're hoping the car will be able to uh, fill in that gap of any, you know, age-related driving issues we might have. Um, yeah, help us be independent longer. Yeah, and I, mean, and I fully um, am hopeful that that, that that will be the case. I mean, can you imagine poor Don having to get me out of the house every time I wanted to go and I couldn't drive myself? <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. So I need Ruby to be able to go what yeah, i need her take to her go to guardian angel that's so, right. yeah exactly guardian angel walmart you know duke garden something like that yep that'd yep. be good i agree so i've mentioned before that i follow several tesla related facebook pages and one of them is the tesla model 3 owners club on facebook and i was delighted to hear and so was dawn that a customer and um Marina Del Rey yesterday had a personal delivery of his Model 3 by Franz Holhausen. He showed up, normal delivery, going through with the regular Tesla employees, and apparently Franz on the way home from work, he just decided, you know what, I'll pop in and do a customer delivery tonight. And um, uh, Andre Mercier, I, I'm guessing that's how he pronounces his name, he um, posted and he posted some pictures of the delivery and a little video of Franz saying here's your car and apparently uh, Franz got in the car and gave him a 45 minute explanation of everything he needed to know. I mean can you imagine how exciting for him. Don and I were just delighted and uh, enjoyed his uh, Facebook post immensely and um, what a special thing to happen to uh, that particular Tesla customer, something uh, positive in uh, the midst of some of uh, the more uh, disappointing news out there right now. I really enjoyed that post. So uh, we're in Ruby now, headed on our way to JC Ralston Arboretum. Um, it's about 60. 65 out there, and I just wanted to get outside in the pretty sunshine for a while. It's so a beautiful Carolina blue sky day, part not a cloud in the sky. Yep. It's a beautiful start. They've improved Auto Park. She knew exactly what I was doing. I'm telling you, she did exactly what I would have done. In other words, I was driving the 20 miles an hour, 
said, oh, well, this spot will do, and I applied brake just like you would normally brake to stop parallel to the car. And when I stopped parallel to the car, or even with the car in front, where I, if I was going to parallel uh, park, where I would have started my parallel park with, I put it in reverse, and all of a sudden the parking assist screen popped up. There was no delay. I mean, it was bang. And we hit start, and it faster than I could have done it, and she parked us. It was really quick, and you can see we're a nice space from the car in front of us here. I'm going to open my door. And uh, we're a perfect space from the curb. Yeah. The key thing I'm trying to say is in prior releases of Auto Park, it wasn't quite as quick. You had to like watch for the P symbol. And when the P symbol appeared, you, um, you, you could stop and, you know, do Auto Park. But it was like I stopped, then the P symbol. It's like she saw it when i went by she now she told me i saw it too you know, in other words i saw the parking place and the car says i saw it too don i'll park there for you and just like i i mean i'm dumbfounded that was just like it was very smooth it was like intuitive exactly the way i no improvement required you know i think the difference in that auto park why it was so startlingly good was because she's using the cameras on the side she, the, the space is way too long for a, a parallel park. It's, it's a very generous gap between the cars. And she chose to leave a big gap at the back and a little gap at the front because she didn't care. She did, Ruby did not care that that car behind us was back there. She wasn't using that car behind us. She was using the car that we pulled up next to her rear view camera and saw all that space this is i can get into that that's my hypothesis well the first thing we were greeted to was this really nice fully butted out japanese maple yeah very pretty the way they've uh, trained it inside here it's just gorgeous so our trip to the arboretum last year is what uh inspired us to get the japanese red maples that we we got last spring and uh, ours are doing good and uh, we're just reminded out here today that there are so many varieties here and that they're just gorgeous. Here's a uh, very nicely trained uh, red bud. And basically keeping Don from his run today. So he's making sure he gets his 10,000 steps while we're out here. We got our, we got our... So I'm gonna have to work on mine then a little bit. <laughs> I was surprised to learn that these beautiful yellow flowers are a type of tulip. They're called a tinka tulip. One of the more interesting structures at the Arboretum is this little uh, building that has bathrooms in it and a really cool weather vane on top. This is a bonfire peach or a prunus persica. So a lot of shade in the arboretum and uh, they do have a lot of helleborus planted as well. Yeah. The sun is just awesome on this uh, Japanese red maple here. The leaves are glowing. Protection? Art? I'm not sure. Interesting. This is an uh, outdoor classroom area that they built last year. No classrooms currently going on but uh, it's cool. This section here is a rose garden and it was added last year as well. Phlox is actually uh, my favorite flower of Easter spring. In all my visits to the Arboretum, the only thing I think is missing is a few more traditional tulips. If you look really hard way at the back, you'll find a couple and that's about it. So they do have an Easter egg event in the Arboretum. You're supposed to find these eggs and uh, I think lift up the letter or look on the back of the letter or I don't know something make note of the letter <laughs> anyway it spells a word there's a there's a game for kids to play
This garden is recently added out here at the very back of the Arboretum and it is the conifer garden. They want to know if you're cuckoo for conifers and they have a little uh, pamphlet to help you make identifications out here. They do have this nice open area for families to picnic and when they host events they're out here on this lawn portion. I'm not sure if this section has a name but there are a lot of hydrangeas and azaleas in here. For kids, young and old alike. This section up top here is elevated and this is the desert garden area. What a beautiful blue spruce. I'm impressed that they're able to keep it alive here. Usually they don't like the uh, warm Carolina summers. Uh, my best guess is that the Easter egg spell spring. So I talked Donnie to get me this little plant. It is a little imp or a abuliton megapotamic um. It's some sort of a flowering maple and it has these really pretty little flowers. I picked one that's getting ready to open. So I'm excited. It can be a container plant for a while. It's kind of little to plant it out in the ground. It says it grows to three foot and it's bushy. The Arboretum last year or the year before put in this really impressive gate. I'm just hanging around waiting for my girl to take all her pictures. <laughs> that could be a while. Yes, Merv. Trust me. I love Donnie just got 10,000 steps. We're over here at South Park. He's helping me get 10,000. We knew he had 10,000. All right, I'm up to 8,000 steps. Mm -hmm. Don was a really good sport. We walked a mile over here. All right, 13,100. <laughs> now I'm gonna go home and feed him. So Don is now testing autopilot on this uh, very curved road. We know enough to pull her out if there's somebody coming in this tight curve. We wouldn't, we wouldn't do that, but without anybody here, we're sort of trying to teach it. Ah, there's a car. All right, Don took control. Yeah, she hasn't let him go back in yet. There you go. She was in state, of course, in traffic aware cruise control after she got sort of jerked out of autopilot, but.